A day of fire in the Persian Gulf. Attacks by the U.S. and counterattacks by Iran. By nightfall, six Iranian vessels were sunk or damaged. One U.S. helicopter was missing. They must know that we will protect our ships, and if they threaten us, they'll pay a price. This is the CBS Evening News. Dan Rather reporting. Good evening. Four days after a U.S. Navy ship was hit by an Iranian mine explosion, the United States retaliated today, and U.S. and Iranian forces exchanged heavy fire for hours across a wide expanse of the Persian Gulf. U.S. warships attacked two strategic oil platforms at Sasan and on Siri Island. That set off a day of shootouts on the sea and in the air. It began early this morning, 9 a.m. in the Gulf, 1.30 a.m. in Washington, when U.S. warships struck an Iranian oil platform in the southern Gulf. 23 minutes later, they struck again at another platform nearby. The platforms were manned by Iranian Revolutionary Guards. They were given several minutes warning to get out before U.S. warships began firing. One of the U.S. ships also sank an Iranian patrol boat when it opened fire on the attacking U.S. force. And a U.S. warship fired missiles at two approaching Iranian fighter planes. At 3.30 in the morning, the White House went public. The government of Iran should understand that we will protect our ships and our interests against unprovoked attacks. About seven hours after the oil platform attack, U.S. forces traded fire with an Iranian warship at the entrance to the Gulf. A Pentagon spokesman said the Iranian frigate was closing rapidly on three U.S. warships, and the Iranian ship then fired at three U.S. aircraft patrolling above. The ships and the planes hit the Iranian vessel with missiles and bombs and set it on fire. We hope they will draw their lesson from this, uh, but if they do uh, continue to attack, uh, then uh, we will take appropriate action. But Iran was not exactly cowed into submission. A few hours after the U.S. attacks in here, an Iranian warship went on the attack near the Iranian island of Abu Musa. It shelled an oil field just off the coast of the United Arab Emirates, an installation formerly owned by a U.S. oil company. It hit a drilling rig, set fire to a British tanker, and fired on a U.S. tugboat but missed it. As dusk fell in the Gulf, there was one more exchange as another Iranian frigate fired on two more U.S. jets from the aircraft carrier Enterprise. The Pentagon said the planes returned fire and hit the ship with a single bomb, leaving it damaged. Iran's news agency said there were deaths and injuries in the platform attacks but gave no details. No U.S. casualties have been confirmed. However, tonight, Defense Secretary Carlucci said a U.S. Cobra helicopter and two crewmen had not returned to base on a Navy cruiser. A search is underway. From the Gulf now, CBS News correspondent Mark Phillips reports on Iran's aggressive response to the U.S. strikes today, Iran's attack on an Arab oil field. The Iranian retaliatory attack left a production platform blazing. The platform is used to separate gas from oil, and it was the gas that was ignited. The entire Mubarak oil field was evacuated and supply ships with firefighting equipment moved in to try to put out the blaze. Miraculously, there were no reports of any casualties among the men working the platforms. But the Iranians seemed intent on keeping the fires going. Three times, Iranian speedboats moved in to chase away the firefighters. They opened up with rockets, spraying the area where the supply ships were operating. Among those vessels was the American-owned and operated Willie Tide out of New Orleans. American flag and water vessel Willie Tide is now departing Mubarak Field. The Willie Tide left at full speed. She was fired on repeatedly. Three, four, five times. Three, four, five times fired at you. Yeah. How close did the shells come? Oh, a couple of boats lengths away. It was, it was close. The Iranians may have thought they were striking an American target today because the oil rig they hit is U.S. registered. However, it is foreign owned and operated. Shipping officials in the Gulf said the Iranian attack was more evidence of how the Revolutionary Guards manning the speedboat seemed out of control. The Iranians, in fact, bought a partial interest in the field they hit today during the time of the Shah and may still share in its revenues. As the confrontations continued into the afternoon, the Iranian platforms hit this morning by the United States showed the intensity of the U.S. attack and revealed evidence of their military purpose. At the end of a day of widespread action in the Gulf, much remains unclear. There are no figures from Iran on casualties and certainly no indication that the Iranians are satisfied with their response and that the confrontation begun today is over. 
Mark Phillips, CBS News in the Gulf. President Reagan is said to have personally ordered the strikes after consulting last night with military and congressional leaders. Bill Plant has our report from the White House. As Iran began fighting back, President Reagan ordered the U.S. military to respond. By midday, Mr. Reagan and his advisors decided to publicly warn the Iranians that the U.S. would continue to meet force with force. We've taken this action to make certain the Iranians have no illusions about the cost of irresponsible behavior. We aim to deter further Iranian aggression, not provoke it. The White House began last night to consult with key members of Congress, and the briefings continued today. That helped bring about a public mood of strong bipartisan support for U.S. retaliation. I think basically it sent them the message, don't fool around too much with the United States. The president has brought us in on the takeoff and intends to keep us fully informed and involved as the action evolves. I think the military action we've taken has been uh, effective. Behind the scenes, some members continue to worry about U.S. policy in the Gulf, and they're calling on the administration to invoke the War Powers Act. That would require Congress to approve the use of American troops. It may be that the activities of today will warrant the invoking of the War Powers Act with U.S. personnel being subjected to hostilities. I don't want the United States to get drugged into a war just accidentally. But this administration, like others, has always sought to avoid the constraints of the War Powers Act by denying that it applies. We don't seek a confrontation with Iran, but we're going to meet our obligations and we're going to live up to our commitments. In fact, says one expert, tension in the Gulf, combined with the massive U.S. naval presence, made today's exchange almost inevitable. Engagement between the Iranians and the Americans is never a surprise. Indeed, it's a surprise that more of these incidents have not taken place. White House sources describe the mood in the West Wing tonight as satisfied. They feel that the U.S. has made its strongest message possible known to the Iranians. Dan? Bill, any embarrassment at the White House about secretly sending all those missiles to the Ayatollah, and what do they expect tomorrow? Dan, no embarrassment that we can find, and they don't know exactly what to expect tomorrow. They have no further contingency plans after today, although the president is scheduled to meet tomorrow with his national security advisors. But the word from the White House is that the U.S. won't make any more attacks unless it is further provoked. But they also admit here, in case there was any doubt about it at all, that U.S. forces are in the Gulf and on the spot until the Iran-Iraq war is over. Thanks, Bill. U.S. military officials say they were at least mildly surprised by Iran's sharp counterattacks today. Eric Ingberg has our report from the Pentagon. A quick, safe trip to the woodshed was what U.S. officials had planned for Iran, not a dangerous shootout with a potential for escalation. But the Khomeini regime, which had meekly accepted U.S. attacks on oil platforms last year, surprised the administration by striking back. I have to only assume that it's some kind of a fanatical reaction or uh, slavish obedience to a contingency plan. Um, but it certainly makes no sense whatsoever in military terms. The U.S. claims the evidence is clear it was an Iranian mine that damaged the frigate Samuel Roberts last week. Exhibit A. Unexploded mines found near the Roberts can be linked to mines found on an Iranian boat, the Iran Ejar, last fall. We've gotten photographic uh, evidence of the mines. We've got the serial numbers, which track with the serial numbers on those of the uh, laid by the Iran Ejar. To Western eyes, Iran's behavior seems so suicidal that some experts theorize Khomeini is purposely trying to destroy his own navy because he mistrusts its moderate officers. Others see a regime which simply misjudged the U.S. will to fight. Their nose has been bloodied. You know, two out of four frigates is, is uh, uh, most of their fleet. And uh, those two probably were the ones that were most operational at the time. So I think that they're going to turn tail and run. The U.S. has 30 ships in the Gulf and no current plans to bring in more. Officials saying there are enough to meet any likely threat. Should the Iranians resume their attacks, our ships are prepared to defend themselves, just as they did today. While no figures on the human cost of this fighting have come from Iran, the death toll could very well be above 200 already, given the number of ships involved and the severity of the damage inflicted by the U.S. Navy so far. Dan? Eric, in that extraordinary footage we saw, were the Iranians firing U.S.-made missiles, or were they missiles bought from some other source? Well, the Iranians don't make their own missiles, Dan, so it had to have come, those, those uh, 
weapons had to have come from somewhere, but there's no intelligence information on where they got them. And what did today's fighting tell us about Iran's military capacity? Well, I think U.S. Uh, military officials would say that despite the feeble effort that the Iranians demonstrated at sea today, uh, that they are not a power that you can uh, uh, declare a paper tiger on the strength of one day's attacks. Modern warfare is so dangerous with weapons that can sink ships and bring airplanes down so quickly that the posture of the U.S. military in the Gulf tonight is going to have to be on guard and very much on their toes. Eric Ingberg at the Pentagon. In the big land war between Iran and Iraq, the Iraqis claimed a major victory today. They said they recaptured the strategic Faw Peninsula at the head of the Gulf. Iraq also pounded Tehran and two other Iranian cities with long-range missiles. Bad news from the war front may turn out to be responsible for a new turn in Iran's foreign policy. Tom Fenton in London has been looking at the... From Lebanon, a report that Marine Lieutenant Colonel Higgins has been killed by the terrorists who took him hostage, though there's no evidence to support that claim. In the Gulf, signs that the minefield that damaged the USS Roberts was planted only last week. And all of this points in one direction. The hand of Iran in various forms seems to be everywhere at the moment. In Iran today, anti-American sentiment was being whipped up at war rallies. Student volunteers were being sent to the front. Middle East experts see a new aggressiveness in Iran. There is inside Tehran a very important power struggle taking place between moderates and radicals. The radicals want to force a confrontation in so far as they can with the United States and other powers. Another reason for this show of aggressiveness is the way the war is going. It is not going well for Iran. Iranian cities are being pounded by Iraqi missiles, and the Iraqi army is suddenly scoring gains in the long stalemated land war. In a telephone interview from Tehran, the war information chief warned the U.S. not to escalate the conflict. Certainly, if uh, they would uh, continue to attack us, they will receive some more attacks from us. Uh... What the experts fear is that the U.S. could be dragged deeper into the seven-and-a-half-year-old Gulf War. By any reasonable standard, Iran would have everything to lose by committing its tiny navy and air force to a duel with the U.S., but the forces of reason may not have the upper hand in Iran now. Tom Fenton, CBS News, London. An Israeli guest evening news. Correspondent Bruce Morton on the apparently tightening race in the key New York presidential primary. And Peter Van Sant on turbulent times for Texas Air and Continental as the government widens its safety inspections. Supreme Game going on right now. Game brochures are at your Oldsmobile dealer or participating McDonald's. Understand so far? Good. Play the Cutlass Supreme Game. You could win an all-new Cutlass Supreme SL or $1,000 in cash. And you'll get a coupon for cash back on a new Cutlass Supreme. Game pieces are at your Olds dealer. You should go there. Any question? Good. The Remington Microscreen shaves as close as a blade or your money back. The first screen shaves incredibly close, the second even closer. The Remington Microscreen shaves as close as a blade or your money back. And the Lady Remington Rechargeable, the perfect gift. Final push for tomorrow's important New York Democratic presidential primary. The candidates react, some of them, to the latest turmoil on the Persian Gulf. Al Gore called President Reagan's actions appropriate. Michael Dukakis ducked. He said he wouldn't comment until he knows more. Jesse Jackson said some of the weapons used by Iran were, quote, no doubt sold Iran illegally by the Reagan-Bush administration, end quote. CBS News chief political correspondent Bruce Morton tonight reports the latest CBS News polling results on the eve of the primary and the scramble of the candidates to get out the vote. Let the rain come down. Let's vote. Let's vote. Let's vote. Campaigning in the rain was in today. Jesse Jackson in Spanish Harlem, Michael Dukakis in the Financial District with his Oscar-winning cousin Olympia at his side. Okay, folks, let's go out and get those votes tomorrow. Getting those votes out tomorrow, political professionals agree, may be the key in what has become a very important primary. It's important that we win New York. Well, whoever loses is going to have to do some scrambling. Okay, we certainly hope that you'll consider Governor Dukakis on Tuesday. That's why the campaigns are concentrating on phone banks and other get-out-the-vote techniques. The conventional wisdom is that Jackson's supporters are the most committed. Win, Jesse, win! I think the rest of us don't have 
as committed a constituency. And the campaign among the candidates continues. New Yorkie, quarrelsome, sometimes mean. Hey, Al Gore, nice to meet you. Need your vote tomorrow. You got it. Some say the meanness in Gore's campaign comes from his chief sponsor here, New York City Mayor Edward Koch, who today accused Jesse Jackson of arrogance and contempt uh, for uh, those who support Israel. The mayor is speaking for himself. And Jackson, for the first time, commented on the hot language here. We have received more death threats in this campaign than all of the others combined because the climate has been one that is so divisive and so violent. So where are we? CBS News polled 775 likely Democratic voters Saturday and Sunday, and we showed Dukakis with a 10-point lead. Jackson and Gore are up a bit. Undecideds have come down. Dukakis's vote seems steady. Jackson gets 90% of the blacks, 15% of the whites, and in this sometimes rancorous campaign, just 6% of the Jews. Turnout could still be the key. It has the potential to be the most important primary we've ever had in New York. After all that time in Iowa and New Hampshire, Marino said today, you guys are here and this could be the ball game. The Big Apple wouldn't have it any other way. Dan? Bruce, what's your own opinion? Could New York be the whole ball game? Oh, I think it could. If Dukakis were to win here with some style, I think uh, political leaders in the states with primaries still to come, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Indiana, might heave a great sigh of relief and say, let's get behind him, let's unite for the fall, it's over. On the other hand, if Jesse Jackson should win here, wonderful confusion. Well, we'll know tomorrow night. Thanks, Bruce. A closer than your next breath finish today for the Boston Marathon, the closest in the 92-year history of that event. After 26 miles, 385 yards, look at this. After a stirring shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder sprint at the finish, Ibrahim Hussein of Kenya beat Juma Ikaga of Tan uh, Tanzania by just one second. Hussein, who won the New York Marathon in November, became the first African to win the Boston competition. Defending champion Rosa Mata of Portugal won the women's title. 6,700 people signed up for the marathon, which started in a light runner's rain and a 48 degree temperature. <laughs> is fit to be tied over deregulation, poor service, and safety worries. CBS News correspondent Peter Van Sant is covering the latest on this on and off the runway. First Eastern, now Continental. Amid growing safety concerns, the FAA today expanded its unprecedented investigation of Texas Air, the nation's largest airline company, sending inspectors out to check each of Continental Airlines' 352 aircraft. They're faced with challenges that, that not others in the airline industry are faced with right now. And we want to make sure that the margins of safety are preserved while they're trying to manage their business. The special inspection of Continental Airlines was ordered after federal investigators uncovered $1 million worth of maintenance violations over the past year and a half. Continental leads the airline industry in passenger complaints. We've been on five Continental planes. Three of them have had mechanical problems. You know what they have the nerve? Continental asked us if we would take a bus. Continental's sister airline, Eastern, was the first major carrier to undergo a plane-by-plane -plane inspection. The FAA says that so far, one in ten Eastern planes checked have been temporarily grounded for maintenance problems. A Presidential Commission on Aviation Safety today recommended the FAA take a tougher safety stance with the nation's airlines. That includes more inspectors, a permanent program of national in-depth inspections and surprise inspections as needed to keep day-to-day -day operations in conformance with safety regulations. Texas Air officials say they welcome the inspections. The FAA today said it is not on a Texas Air witch hunt and that other major airlines may soon face plane-by-plane -plane inspections. Peter Van Sant, CBS News, Atlanta. It's not unusual that Subaru has sold a lot of cars. What is unusual is how many of them are still running. An astonishing 92% of all Subarus registered since 1978 are still on the road. And now, if you buy a Subaru, you'll get back as much as $2,000. Of course, that $2,000 may not be built to last, but at least you know your Subaru is. 
Vanish Drop-Ins, the Bull Brothers. Increasingly common as colleges dedicated to producing tomorrow's best and brightest battle over resurgent racism associated with the kind of hate groups that traditionally appeal to society's outcasts. Betsy Aaron investigated. At the University of Wisconsin in Madison, protest and anger. I'm so sick of this place. No longer will we stand by and watch subtle and blatant racism. At the University of Pennsylvania, frustration. There's a lot of hostility here at the university concerning racial matters, and I'm not sure how it can be improved. Add up the individual incidents, and the whole becomes much greater than its parts violence, frustrations, slights, are being interpreted by black students as signs that they are not being treated equally or fairly, and they've had enough. Don't underestimate our intelligence. We know all the processes. A meeting today between black students and the Penn State administration. The students are angry and the mood is tense. Ten days ago, 89 were arrested for staging a sit-in to press black demands. I believe there's a severe, uh, I guess you'd say, form of institutional racism that does occur at Penn State. This from Penn State's president. I think we have not been sensitive enough to input from those students as to how we do what we're doing. Today, the university agreed to amnesty for all those arrested. There are demands for a growth in the numbers of black students, faculty, and administrators, and an increase in financial aid. Uh, we are prepared to respond to that uh, at some point. I would... From a tenured professor, an assessment of Penn State's administration. I'd say that it's ultra-conservative, period. Um, reasonably insensitive and comparatively out of touch. This is Penn State. It could be Denison College in Ohio or Duke University in North Carolina. What we need to do is to deal with attitudes and behavior because much of what we're seeing now is not anything that can be corrected by more laws. In the spring of 88, the confrontations could happen anywhere. Betsy Aaron, CBS News, Penn State. And on a particularly busy news day, that's the CBS Evening News. Dan Rather, see you tomorrow. Good night. When it's time to sell your Century 21 action warranty. Graffiti with Old English oil. It moisturizes to help prevent drying and cracking. Brings out wood's natural beauty in the glorious manner that befits my glorious manner. Old English helps prevent drying and cracking.